So, welcome to today's lecture where what we are going to do is continue from where we left off in the last lecture where we were analyzing the uh, linear stability of uh, the Rayleigh Baynard problem. So, just for a brief recollect, we had taken the stationary solution and uh, we had imposed small perturbations on this stationary solution and these perturbations are actually being denoted by the tilde variable. So, T tilde represents the perturbation on temperature, V tilde represents the perturbation on uh, velocity and uh, we started with the original nonlinear equations and we linearized the equations about the steady state. So, what this basically means is we assume the perturbations to be of order epsilon and retain terms only of order epsilon to the power 1. We do not consider terms of terms of order epsilon squared because they are higher order terms and they are negligibly small. So, when you do this you get a bunch of linearized equations. So, what we have done is if you remember you had the perturbations on u the x component of velocity the perturbation on pressure p tilde and we have eliminated those two variables and you had four perturbations on the two velocity components on the pressure and on temperature. What we did is we eliminated two and we have reduced it to a system of two equations one on the temperature perturbation and one on the vertical velocity component perturbation and this is what we had derived in the last class. What we want to do now is that take the analysis further and uh, in our quest for getting an analytical solution. Okay? You observe that these two equations are linear and they are also coupled. The temperature equation has velocity in it, the velocity equation has temperature in it. So, you have to solve them simultaneously and uh, you also observe that they are homogeneous that is every term present in each of the equation contains the perturbation variable or the derivative of it to the first power. Okay? So, they are linear and there is no non-homogeneity and these are important characteristics of a linearized uh, problem. So, what we want to do now is remember that the temperature and the velocity perturbations are actually functions of are dependent on x, y and t the time. They are independent on z where we assume the spine to be infinity and uh, which basically means that these are partial differential equations. So, what we will do is we would like to convert these to a set of ordinary differential equations. So, we are going to seek the solution as t tilde of x comma y comma t as being equal to t star of y times e power sigma t times sin alpha x and v tilde of x comma y comma t as v star of y times e power sigma t times sin alpha x. What have I done here? I am going to give two interpretations to this functional form that I am seeking. 
one is the physical interpretation the physical interpretation is i'm going to seek solutions which are periodic in the x direction now the fact that the x direction extends to infinity allows me to actually seek periodic solutions in the x direction i do not have to worry about boundary conditions in the x direction and uh, the fact that this is a linear equation which is first order in time allows me to seek the time dependency to be exponential and sigma is the growth rate of the disturbance in time okay the y dependency is captured in p star and v star so clearly if you have a system which is stable then the real part of sigma is going to be negative and that implies stability and if the real part of sigma is going to be positive this implies the steady state is unstable okay so this is the physical interpretation the other interpretation is a mathematical interpretation the mathematical interpretation comes from the techniques you have learned in your mathematical courses where you have been talking about uh, taking Laplace transforms and Fourier transforms. So, when you are taking a Fourier transform or a Fourier sine transform or a Fourier cosine transform, you are essentially seeking a periodic solution in the x direction. When you take a Laplace transform, you are essentially seeking a time dependency in the Laplace domain and which is also going to be exponential. Our objective is to you know seek solutions of this kind and get uh, the p star of y and v star of y. That is what we are going to do is we are going to convert this bunch of partial differential equations here to a bunch of ordinary differential equations which are going to describe t star and v star. Okay? So, remember that is the objective convert partial differential equations to ordinary differential equations. We can do that by uh, using a physical argument or we can use a mathematical argument. So, let us write this down. We want to convert PDEs to ODEs, ordinary differential equations. The first is a physical argument where we seek periodic solutions in space. and exponentially varying solutions in time. The second is more of a mathematical argument. Mathematical interpretation. We take a Fourier sine transform in the x direction and a Laplace transform in time. So, the fact that we have actually assumed the x to extend to infinity is what is allowing us to do a Fourier sine transform. Okay? And this is where the assumption of x being large 
uh, comes in handy. The form assumed for the temperature and the velocity here implicitly assumes that the temperature and the velocity are in phase as far as the spatial dependency is concerned. That is both of them are varying as sinusoidal. It is not that one is varying as a sine and the other is varying as cosine. Okay? And uh, whether they are actually going to be in phase or not, we can find out only by substituting these equations, these forms for the perturbation in these governing equations. So, if it turns out that by substituting these forms in these equations, the uh, e power sigma t and sin alpha x occurs in every term, then you can essentially cancel off the e power sigma t and sin alpha x okay, from every term. And, uh, which means that such a solution is possible and this has to be true for both the equations. Okay? So, that is basically what we are going to do now. We are going to substitute these forms for the perturbation in these equations and find out how uh, this equation can be reduced to an ordinary differential equation. So, let us do that. Uh, but before we proceed, I am going to make a some uh, small calculations so that it will allow me to proceed faster. So, let us see what is the time derivative of the temperature. So, supposing we were interested in calculating d by dt of t tilde, I need to get d by dt of t star of y e power sigma t sin alpha x. This is a function of y, that is a function of x, this depends on time. So, when I differentiate, I am going to just have to differentiate only this term and this is going to give me sigma multiplied by e power sigma t times sin alpha x times t star of y. Okay? That is how the time derivative is found. Now, let us look at how one can calculate del squared of t tilde. Remember del square is two dimensional, it only has variations in x and y and so del square is essentially d square by d x square plus d square by d y square of t tilde which is t star of y e power sigma t sin alpha x. Now, when I am going to differentiate this term with respect to x, these are for all practical purposes constant and the derivative of sin alpha x, the first derivative is going to be alpha times cosine alpha x. And when I differentiate it one more time, I am going to get minus alpha square and I get back sine. So, please understand that this is going to be the same as the first term is going to give me, if I look at the first term, I am going to get minus alpha square times sin alpha x times t star of y times e power sigma t. And now, when I am going to differentiate this with respect to y, these are going to be constant and what I have is essentially the second derivative of t star, but since t star is only a function of y, it is not going to be a partial derivative anymore, but it is going to be a total derivative and this is going to be written as d square by d y square of t star times e power sigma t times sin alpha x. Uh, 
I can take out a par sigma t and sine alpha x common from these two terms and I can write this in a slightly more compact way as d squared by d y squared minus alpha squared of t star multiplied by e power sigma t sin alpha x okay the derivative operator is only in the y direction is alpha squared is of course the uh, wave number of the periodic disturbance okay it is the reciprocal of a wave number uh, of the wavelength sorry this, this is the wave number which is the reciprocal of the spatial wavelength and uh, these are the time dependency. So, what is normally done is to make things a bit more compact I am going to write this as t star times a power sigma t times sin alpha x where d squared is nothing but d squared by dy squared. So, remember this is the Laplacian of t tilde. You see that there is also del to the power 4 operator occurring in the velocity equation. So, the del power 4 operator of the velocity equation is going to be of the velocity variable is going to be nothing but del squared squared of velocity okay and you already know that del squared of velocity is nothing but d squared minus uh, uh, alpha squared of v star e power sigma t sin alpha x because now it is velocity instead of t star I am going to have v star and so this is going to basically reduce to d squared minus alpha squared the whole squared of v star e power sigma t sin alpha x okay again this operator is operating only on v star remember v star is a function only of y and this derivative d capital d here is a derivative only with respect to y okay so that's basically what uh, we have done we have just made sure that uh, the partial differential operator del power 4 can be converted to an ordinary differential operator d squared. Now, um, it may appear to you that I have actually jumped a step, but if you understood how you have done this, I think what you would do is um, just go through the algebra and you can verify for yourself that this is indeed correct. That is one when you apply del squared you get the uh, d squared minus alpha squared. When you apply it again you get another d squared minus alpha squared and that basically gives you this okay. So, if you are not comfortable with this I suggest you work this out uh, uh, in your home and make sure that this is indeed right. Our job now is to basically substitute these expressions in my partial differential equation and convert it to an ordinary differential equation. So, let us do that. So, the first equation here on temperature now when I were to look at the time derivative with respect to temperature I would get only sigma okay and uh, this has got v tilde I am going to write this as v star of t h minus t 0 divided by h and what I have done is replace all my tilde variables in terms of my star variables okay. So, this is going to be sigma times t star because remember the temperature derivative with time is nothing but sigma times t star okay and you also have the e power sigma t times sin alpha x okay and the right hand side is nothing but d squared minus alpha squared of t star 
times e power sigma t times sin alpha x and that is what we just did. We showed that del square can be reduced to d square minus alpha square of t star e plus sigma d sin alpha x and v tilde is v star times that. When you differentiate this, I get a sigma times t star and this. Now, remember we had made this assumption of things being in phase. Okay. Now, the fact that we are on the right track that the velocity and the temperature are indeed in phase is going to be confirmed by the fact that every term here has this the exponential term and the sine term. Okay. So, this is basically an indication that indeed those variables are in phase. So, this now reduces to rho naught C p times sigma t star plus v star times t h minus t 0 divided by h equals d square minus alpha square of t star. So, this is again a linear equation, but now it is a linear ordinary differential equation. What I like to do next is take the second equation here this equation and convert it to a ordinary differential equation. So, when I do that I get rho 0 times the time derivative gives me a sigma and the del square operator gives me a d square minus alpha square okay. and there is already a minus sign. So, that gives me this minus sign. So, what I am doing is I am looking at this term here. I am looking at this term and I am getting a sigma because of this time derivative. This del square gives me the d square minus alpha square and v tilde remember is now going to get converted to v star. Okay. And this gives me v star of e power sigma t times sin alpha x. That is my left hand side. On the right hand side, I have two terms. The first term is the del power 4 operator, which is nothing but d squared minus alpha squared whole squared of v star times e power sigma t times sin alpha x. Okay. So, the, this is the viscous term where which goes with the fourth order del or del power 4 and that gives me my d square minus alpha square squared times v star times e power sigma t sin alpha x and then you have the body force term which remember is this term here. This term here is the body force term and uh, this is associated with the second derivative with respect to x. Now, this is something which I had not done earlier, but remember the x dependency is sinusoidal. So, when I am differentiating it twice, I am going to get a minus alpha squared multiplying this and so this term now is going to be reduced to minus rho naught beta g alpha squared okay, times t star times e power sigma t times sin alpha x. All I have done is said that invoked the fact that the second derivative of t tilde is nothing but minus alpha squared of t star. Again, what we see is that the exponential term and the sinusoidal term cancels off because they are present in all the terms they cannot be 0 because if they were 0 then my perturbation itself is 0 because I have assumed the perturbation to be of the form e power sigma t sin alpha x. So, they are non-zero and that basically justifies and allows me to cancel them and the fact that they are occurring in all the terms tells me that the assumed form of the spatial dependence for temperature and uh, velocity in the x direction, the periodic sin alpha x in phase 
is indeed right. Okay? If they are not cancelled off, then it means that those velocity components are actually out of phase with the temperature component. And there are situations where variables can be out of phase. So, this equation now simplifies to minus sigma times rho naught times d squared minus alpha squared times v star equals minus mu times d squared minus alpha squared whole squared v star minus rho naught beta g alpha squared t star. Okay. So, what I have done is converted partial differential equations to ordinary differential equations. And the idea is I know how to solve ordinary differential equations especially because these equations are linear. What I am going to do now is tell you that the objective we have is to find this point of onset of natural convection. Okay. When exactly is natural convection going to start? That is this critical value of the temperature gradient for a fixed fluid and the geometry. So, when the temperature gradient is less than this critical value, if you were to impose any disturbance, this disturbance would actually decay and you would have the system going back to the stationary solution where the fluid does not move. Okay. If your temperature difference is more than this critical value, when you are going to be giving a disturbance, the disturbance will get amplified such that you would actually see convection. So, the transition between the stable to the unstable is going to take place by looking at the real part of the growth constant in time sigma. If the real part is negative, I have a stable system. If the real part is positive, I have a, an unstable system. So, the critical point where you have the change from stable to unstable is going to be given by the condition that the real part of sigma is 0. Okay. So, for the onset of natural convection, okay, the critical condition is given by the real part of sigma equals 0. And uh, one of the things which we can establish and I am not going to do that in this course is show that the, for this particular problem the sigma is real. That is the sigma is not complex, there is no imaginary component. Okay. And, uh, so, rather than talk about the real part of sigma being 0, I am going to talk about the sigma being 0. Okay. We can show that sigma equals is real. So, transition occurs at sigma equal to 0. Now, I just give you an inkling of how we can go about proving that sigma is indeed real and this arises because um, you know matrices which are real symmetric, okay, they have the property that their eigenvalues are real. And uh, what we can do is generalize this idea of a real symmetric matrix to that of a Hermitian matrix to that of what is known as a self adjoint operator. 
So, rather than talk about matrices, we can look upon this as an operator. A matrix takes a vector and converts it to another vector. This is an operator which takes a function, converts it to another function and we can talk in terms of eigenvalues of this operator. And for this particular system, we can look at uh, the fact that whether it is self adjoint or not and uh, establish that sigma is 0. So, this is just some piece of information I am giving you for those of you who are interested in pursuing this. Otherwise, you just accept what I am saying, sigma is uh, indeed real and so the transition occurs at sigma being 0. So, since I am interested only in the onset of natural convection, what I am going to do is I am going to further simplify my equations by putting sigma equal to 0 in these ordinary differential equations that I have just derived which describe my V star and T star. Okay? So, we put sigma equal to 0 to find the transition. And that basically means this particular equation reduces to mu times d squared minus alpha squared whole squared times v star equals minus rho naught beta g alpha square t star. I just want to make sure that I am not messing up a um, negative sign anywhere because I might get into trouble later and the other equation becomes rho naught C p times T h minus T naught divided by h times V star equals D squared minus alpha square of T star. See, I have two equations now, but these are ordinary differential equations and they have uh, velocity and temperature and you can see that the velocity and the temperature are again coupled to each other. Okay? Remember, all these are constants which I know for a given experimental system. What I would like to do now is write down the boundary conditions for this uh, system of equations that we have. Okay? The condition on temperature is going to be obtained from the boundary conditions on temperature that is going to be telling me what the boundary conditions are for the perturbation. So, remember T equals T naught at y equals 0 okay? and you know that T was written as T s s plus epsilon times T tilde. Okay? And, uh, what we want to do is, we know that T s s is equal to T 0 at y equal to 0. Therefore, you know T s s equals T 0 at y equal to 0, which basically implies that T tilde equals 0 at y equals 0. Okay. So, basically since the steady state satisfies the boundary condition of the original problem, the perturbation is going to vanish at y equal to 0. Similarly, and what we have done is we have decomposed T tilde to T star of y and so this is actually the condition on T star of y. T star equals 0 at y equal to 0 because T tilde is nothing but T star multiplied by E power sigma T sin alpha x and those are uh, in independent of y. So, the only way T tilde can vanish is if T star can vanish. So, you can similarly establish that T star equals 0 at 
y equals capital H. These are the boundary conditions on the temperature perturbation. Look at the equation for velocity. This is a fourth order equation for velocity. And therefore, I need four conditions, two on the upper plate and two on the lower plate. Remember, V star is my vertical component of velocity. So, since my plate is impermeable, the liquid cannot penetrate my upper plate. And so, the velocity component is going to be 0, V is going to be 0 at both y equal to 0 and h. Okay? And so, I am just going to write this here that V tilde equals 0 at V equals 0 at y equals 0 and h. This follows from the fact that the liquid cannot penetrate the wall. And V remember is nothing but V s s plus epsilon times V 1 tilde, V tilde and this is 0 and this is 0 at y is equal to 0 and h and therefore, this implies V tilde is 0 at y equals 0 comma h and uh, in other words v star is 0 at y equals 0 comma h. Okay? So, I have v star also being 0. So, I have Dirichlet conditions on temperature and on velocity v star, but do I have enough conditions to solve the problem? The answer is no since I actually have a fourth order equation remember in V star. So, I need four boundary conditions and what I have is only two boundary conditions. So, I need two more boundary conditions. Where am I going to get this from? I am going to get this from the conditions on the x component of velocity u. Remember what we have done is we have con uh, converted this problem simplified it by eliminating the x component of velocity. In this process, we have not used the boundary conditions on the x component of velocity. Okay? So, we have to figure out a way for converting the boundary conditions on the x component of velocity to conditions on the y component of velocity v star. So, let us see how we can do that. And let me give you a clue, we are going to use the equation of continuity to accomplish this. Okay? So, what I want to do is, I want to get two more boundary conditions for V star by using the boundary conditions on the x component of velocity u star. Okay? So, the no slip boundary condition implies that u equals 0 at y equals 0 and h and you can make the same argument, but the steady state is zero, uh, velocity is 0 at 0 and h and so u tilde which is equal to u star equals 0 at y equals 0 and h and this is my no slip. So, this is the boundary condition on my original velocity, this is the boundary condition on my x component of the perturbation velocity. So, this is for the original and this is for the perturbation. I want to convert this to a boundary condition on V star. Remember, du by dx plus dv by dy equals 0. That is my equation of continuity. And I am going to write this again in terms of my perturbation variables. So, I get du tilde by dx plus dv tilde by dy equals 0. You can convert this to star variables, but remember u tilde is nothing but 0 and y equal to 0 and h. So, that means all along for all x, this is true at y equals 0 and h. No, sorry, this is not true at y is equal to 0 and h. Um, this is the equation of continuity which is always valid, but u tilde is 0 at y equal to 0 and h, which means 
that u tilde does not change with x for no matter what the position is in the horizontal direction no matter what the x position is u tilde is 0. So, not only is u tilde 0, but d u tilde by d x is also 0 u tilde equals 0 for all x. So therefore, d u tilde by d x equals 0 at y equals 0 and h. So, that means, if d u tilde by d x is 0, that means, the first derivative of v tilde is 0 at y equal to 0 and h. And this I can use to say that d v star equals 0 at y equals 0 and h. So, this is the boundary condition which I have on velocity. Okay. So, what I have done is basically these are the extra two boundary conditions which I was talking about earlier which I need to solve my problem. And this basically tells me that the first derivative of the velocity perturbation v star is 0 at the two walls. So, now I have six boundary conditions and I am all set to solve the problem. Okay. However, uh, what we will now do is do a further simplification and uh, this simplification is going to come by converting the system of two equations that we have to only one equation, one variable. So, what we have here is a system of two equations which are coupled to each other in two variables v star and t star. I like to write this as a system of equations or only a one equation in only one unknown v star. That is, I want to eliminate my temperature perturbation between these two equations. Okay. I like to keep my equation uh, as if it is an equation which describes only the velocity perturbation without bringing into account the temperature perturbation. So, let us do that uh, by operating on both sides by d squared minus alpha squared. So, if I do that, I would these are all constants. I will have d square minus alpha square of t star. I can use this equation and substitute for that expression from here and that way I can eliminate t star. Okay. So, operating on this equation by uh, d square minus alpha square, what I get is mu times d square minus alpha square whole cube of v star equals minus rho naught beta g alpha square of d square minus alpha square t star. So, that is what I have done. I have just operated on that using d square minus alpha square and now I am going to use the fact that d square minus alpha square of t star is given by my velocity perturbation from the second equation to write this as minus rho naught beta g alpha square and d square minus alpha square t star is nothing but rho naught C p times T h minus T naught divided by h ok. You know I think I have missed a thermal conductivity somewhere. I have missed a thermal conductivity here. I miss the thermal conductivity in that equation. So, this thermal conductivity is important okay, because remember the del square goes comes with the thermal conductivity and so I would have a k at the bottom here. And uh, I can write this equation now as d square minus alpha square whole cube of v star equals minus rho naught beta rho naught by b, uh, mu times beta times g times rho naught C p by k times T h minus T 0 divided by h and I am go going to write I have missed a v star here and that is going to be a v star here. 
okay. So, all I have done is rewritten this as it is here and that is an alpha squared which is important. I brought the mu down, down here in the denominator. I am going to remember that this is nothing but my kinematic viscosity and this is nothing but my thermal diffusivity alpha t and I am going to write this as minus beta g alpha squared divided by nu the kinematic viscosity times the thermal diffusivity times T h minus T 0 divided by h times V star. Okay. So, these are my, this is my sixth order equation and like I said I need six boundary conditions. I have found four boundary conditions on velocity that is the velocity perturbation and the first derivative must be 0. But my remember my other two boundary conditions are on temperature. So, again what I want to do is I want to convert my temperature boundary condition to a velocity boundary condition. Okay. And uh, how do I do that? Aha. I should not have erased that. Um, sorry. Yeah. I am going to use the fact that T star is 0 at y equal to 0 and h. See, if T star is equal to 0 at y equal to 0 and h, that means this term has to be 0 at y equal to 0 and h and so from since t star equals 0 at y equals 0 and h this implies b square minus alpha square whole square of v star equals 0 at y equals 0 and h. So, what I have done is I have converted my boundary condition on temperature to my boundary condition on velocity. Okay. So, this six order equation that I have just written is going to basically need six boundary conditions and the six boundary conditions are V star equals d V star equals d square minus alpha square whole square of V star equals 0 at y equals 0 and h and the differential equation is d square minus alpha square whole cube of v star equals minus beta g alpha square times nu by alpha t times t h minus t 0 by h v star. So, this is the differential equation, these are the boundary conditions and what we have to do is see how we can solve this. We will do this in the next class. Thank you.